Hello, everybody. Nice to see you again. My name is Sarah, and we're going to do, oh, hang on, let me make sure my audio is off. Um, we're going to do a couple of hours of exploring financial data um, using data science practices. Uh, I am not a financial data expert or finance expert or financial advisor. I don't know things about finance, uh, which is what interested me about this type of project. Um, lately, I've been starting to learn about stocks and the stock market and things like that. And um, I know that machine learning and data science, I mean, basically, it's all data, right? I mean, excluding things like insider knowledge, it's all data, it's all uh, trends, it's um, understanding what has happened in the past, what types of companies um, who trade on the stock market uh, correlate with each other, why. Um, there's also some interesting bits about, you know, what kinds of news articles are out there and what are they saying about certain companies or certain industries or things like that. And so um, we're just going to start exploring the financial world with data science practices in today's stream. Uh, but in general, uh, this is just kind of an interesting topic, and we've got a bunch of uh, different types of projects out there um, on our repositories, and that we're going to be doing in future streams and in future workshops. Audio is choppy. Hmm. I'm sorry about that. It might be my bandwidth. I'm trying to not use anything else. Um, it looks... Let's see. It might be my bandwidth. I don't know if there's much I can do right now, because um, on my end it looks like it's coming in okay. Um, okay, audio is pretty bad. Um, I'm going to try switching to a different audio source, but I think it'll be worse. So we're going to try um, not streaming my face for a minute and see if the audio gets any better. So let me know if the audio is any better. Yeah, I think my bandwidth might not be high enough. That is better. Okay, we're going to try not having my face on and seeing if that works. Let me know if it's okay. Awesome. Good. Thanks all. I appreciate it. Um, I do try to just not have my camera on most of the time because I've noticed that with my bandwidth. So apologies and thanks for bearing with me. Um, so yeah, I mean, basically, uh, we've got a lot of projects in upcoming streams and workshops that we're excited about in terms of financial data and um, why data science and machine learning plays or how it plays a role um, in that world. Today, we're going to be starting with um, exploring some of this data and in particular we're going to be exploring stocks and um, if you want to follow along I will be posting the code that we write today up on our github repo but you will need to have a uh, visual studio and um, I believe this is my Doo -doo -doo. Um, so you will need to have visual studio let me make sure I turn my face okay good um, perfect. So you will need to have Visual Studio Code installed and uh, you will need to have Python and the Jupyter Notebooks extension. If you haven't done this before, we do actually have some instructions on how to get started. Let me pull those up and get you the link for those. Um, this was on an earlier stream, but we do have... Um, So some of the basics of getting it started are on this 
setup guide here. Um, and then in general on the Visual Studio Code, um, there's a data science, like getting your environment set up for data science. And yes, we're going to do quantitative today, but we do actually have some qualitative like analysis projects that I am excited to, to do in the future slash will be on our repo uh, where we do sentiment analysis on the news articles, which I think would be really fun and interesting. Um, so let me pull up the so you can see it. Um, so this guide right here will walk you through installing Visual Studio Code, the Python extension. Um, I chose to create, actually, I didn't choose to create a, an Anaconda environment this time. Um, I just did it on my local environment. But the recommendation is an Anaconda environment, uh, including Pandas, uh, Jupyter, Seaborn, Scikit-Learn in particular, and um, making sure that you're using that environment inside of VS Code. So if you want to follow along getting started with that, um, you will need this for the uh, for the um, for following along later as well and we do on this link here we will have um, all of the event resources so you can see for July we actually will have the um, resources for today's stream I will link them here um, so if you want to get this code after the fact and try it out you can do that all right Let's go back over to VS Code. And I like to stall a little bit. And I see, I think it's kind of blurry. So I apologize for that. Let me try to, oh, right. Obviously, I can't zoom in here. I'm going to make sure that the VS Code is zoomed in, though, um, as much as I can. For this project, uh, we will actually be using, and I haven't uploaded it yet, um, but there's um, a data source and it actually is uploaded somewhere else. So if you wanna grab it right now, before I add it to that table for July, you can grab it from, right here, perfect. Um, so inside of this repos inside of this folder here, you can find to uh, a CSV and a CSV zip. In particular, we're going to be exploring with the zip file. So this is the prices split adjusted CSV zip file. Um, so you can go ahead and, and grab that if you want to follow along. You should be able to just download it. And I'm not showing you right now, so let me do that. Um, when you click on that link, you should be able to just download that and it'll download the zip file. It's fairly large. It's 15 megabits megabytes um uh but um and it'll also be linked to from the online resources july event resources it'll be linked to from here um right after the stream all right so all i have so far is an empty jupyter notebook file and uh, the, the zip file, but also the CSV, just so that we can take a look at it. The zip file has much more data, but the CSV, actually, I think the CSV is, yeah, the CSV is a, a total unzipped version. You don't need to unzip it, though. Um, so I've got the data here and an empty Jupyter Notebook file. In VS Code, when you save a file with .ipynb, it'll save as a Jupyter Notebook file and give you this Jupyter Notebook interface um, if you have Python extension and the Jupyter extension installed. So just to, to demonstrate that, um, for example, if I just did this, IPYNB, it'll connect to the kernel and open it in that way. All right. Perfect. So we're going to kind of start from the beginning here. Um, today, we're going to see just as far as we can get on exploring this stock data and what it means, um, like what we can do with it. Uh, this data is coming from Kaggle. And you can find the original data source right here. 
All right. So uh, in this project, we're going to be looking at forecasting basically whether or not we want to buy certain stocks. Um, as a reminder, I said at the very beginning, but I am not a financial advisor. This is not financial advice. This is simply the opportunity to explore um, how people in the financial industry might approach analyzing stock historical um, stock data to determine whether or not they want to buy or sell stock. So while we'll, we will be doing things that are similar to what they might be doing, they likely have much better um, models and have spent many more hours than the two that we're going to start exploring today. So the first thing that we need to do is bring in all of the tools that we're going to need. And um, by the way, this, this stream is really a continuation of the theme of um, data science from a developer's perspective. And so that's why we like to stick in, in, in Visual Studio Code and we like to explore using Python. These are, as a developer for me, tools and languages that are much more accessible to me and um, kind of uh, that I know about. And so Francesca, Lazari, and I, uh, on Monday of this week, we did a live stream introducing our intro our developers introduction to data science video series. Um, and really, I just want to make sure that we always have this practical guide to how to explore data. Um, but for me, data science is difficult to understand if I don't have some kind of context. And so I've been on the hunt for various types of contexts. Uh, in the past, I've done streams on uh, genome data. Um, right now I'm doing uh, the stream on stock uh, market data. Um, I've also done some on like wine data. So like how to determine whether or not wine is good. And for me personally, I think that having some kind of context allows me to understand these concepts much better. So while this is um, a little bit of a, of a conceptual explanation, it's going to be mostly a um, uh, a practical guide to how to get started on, on doing this. So the first thing that we're going to do is bring in all of the libraries that we need. And if you've done any of this before, this is going to look very familiar. Oops. Um, so we want to import NumPy and Pandas, which are two li libraries that help us um, do better uh, data analysis um, at larger scales. So in, in Python, we have things like lists. In Pandas, we have things like data frames. And data frames have um, you know, column titles, row indexes, uh, and you can perform a lot more complex operations on them. Uh, we also want to import some libraries that allow us to visualize our data. Um, this one here, the profiling library or package, is um, one that I've, I've just started to learn about. And basically, it allows us to start to see our data in kind of like this profile report, which you'll see in a little bit. Um, the scikit-learn package has a lot of what we're going to need for doing the actual kind of machine learning models and the analysis of the data. So for example, we're going to use the mean squared error. Um, uh, uh, oh, my brain just stopped for a second. Um, oh, where's that word? Uh, like analysis, I can't think of the word right now. For some reason, my brain forgot the word. Um, but basically, it's going to allow us to determine the score, like the scoring, how well, how accurate, the accuracy of our model, right? Um, and we, we actually used the mean squared error in the video series as well. Um, in that video series, we were doing a, um, an analysis of bit, kind of the same thing here, but this was, I was building a, a bike sharing app and um, I wanted to predict how many bikes would be rented um, within the next or like over the next certain amount of days I think we did 14 days in that one and while what we did in that video series was pretty similar to what we're going to be doing here um, the difference is in the context and the narrative there we were predicting essentially the um, products that we had and the, and the sales of those products um, from the perspective of 
uh, like pe what people might actually be doing. And so the information that we needed to um, do that prediction might also depend on things like, was it a holiday? Was it a normal work day? Things like that. In this context, we're doing things around um, uh, stocks. And while holidays might be interesting when it comes to stocks, we also have some other interesting bits. For example, um, if it's a weekend, we're not going to have data uh, based on our stocks, right? Because there's, there isn't trading. Okay, so these are all of the different um, scikit-learn packages, uh, models, et cetera, that we, we're going to use for today. And the last thing is this magic command uh, matplotlib inline, which will allow us to see any of the graphs that we do inline. So again, feel free to follow along uh, in real time, but also we will be posting this file uh, at a later time right after the stream. I'll, I'll push it up. Okay, so we'll run this cell and that brings in all of our um, libraries and packages. So the next thing that we need to do is actually start to look at our data. Now we can look at our data over here um, and, I, and I recommend that you do look at your data in kind of raw form when you're first starting out just to kind of like understand what's going on. So we've, it looks like we've got a date if I just kind of glance through my data, I see that it's, it looks like it's dates from 2010 to 2016. If I just kind of glance quickly. It looks like we've got the symbol, so that's going to be the company, the, the stock symbol. Uh, an, open an open amount, a close amount, the low, the high, and the volume. Okay. So um, first what we're going to do is we're going to read in the CSV file into um, a data frame that we're going to call stocks. Uh, one thing that we can do if you are low on memory, for example, is you can actually specify if there are a certain number of rows that you want to limit it to. Um, I don't need to limit to a certain number of rows. I happen to have this massive machine with lots of memory, so I'm going to keep that as none. Uh, but I want to put that in there just in case uh, you might be running on a machine that doesn't have as much memory and you don't want to bring in all of that data um, into your local memory. So we're going to create a data frame um, called stocks and we're going to use pandas to read in the CSV file. And this CSV file is in the data folder and it's called prices split adjusted dot CSV dot zip because I'm um, assuming you don't want to download the entire CSV file and instead you want to download the zip file. So data prices split adjusted dot CSV dot zip. And uh, this is where you would specify how many rows you want to basically like you want to stop at. And I want to parse dates. Um, I'm specifically saying that that the date column contains dates and that's I want to parse those dates. Um, and the column that I want to use as my index. And so basically I don't want our dates column to be read in like a string. I want it to be read in like a date. Okay. Perfect. So um, a couple of things that you might have encountered in the past that are just basic to any kind of analysis that you might do on any kind of data. We can run the info function on our data frame and we can get basically this high level explanation of what our data frame contains, what our data set is. So it looks like we've got um, 851,264 unique entries. Hello. Um, and it looks like we're not missing any data, right? So we've got each of our columns has the same number of entries and they are not null. Um, and then we also have the types that they are. So the first one is an object because that's the string. That's the, remember we're using the date as our, as our index. So we're not counting that one. Um, but this one is a string. It's the symbol. And then the rest are integers because they're either prices or the volume. Because, or not integers, floats. Um, numbers is what I meant to say. Yeah, I didn't know that either. This is um, some, the fact that you can read in a zip file directly into pandas. Um, 
Is it important to study the math behind machine learning or does data science get used by libraries? Yeah, you know, so I am just starting to understand the math behind machine learning. I am not a machine learning expert from that perspective. The great thing about a lot of the libraries, both that exist in things like um, uh, Scikit-Learn and also in things like Azure Machine Learning, which is a full service, is that they're handling all of the math part. Now, I will say that it is it is important to un to like have a high level understanding um, of the machine learning models and algorithms so that you know which ones you want to be using, uh, because the way that those models analyze and predict and things like that um, are going to affect the kind of outcome you will get. So in our video series, we talk a little bit about the different types of models that will um, target different types of data and different types of outcomes and different types of analyses. Um, but I personally have not done a full deep dive into the actual mathematics behind it. So while I don't think that you need to stop and go learn the entire mathematical kind of theory and, and practice behind the machine learning models before you get started, um, I do think that if you are going to do something with machine learning models inside of a real application, especially one that heavily like influences people or 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 things like that or our world I do think you should have a machine learning expert who can at least kind of give you that high level explanation or, or gut check you um, next Thursday I'll actually be exploring eight different types of machine learning models on a stream at the same time so hopefully we'll, we'll get to explore those a little bit further um, so because, uh, so another thing that we can do is um, take a look at the first few. So let's say you didn't actually download the CSV file, you only downloaded the zip file. We wouldn't have had an opportunity to view this CSV in this format. Um, so all we would know so far is that uh, these are the columns and this is the number in the columns. So one really useful function that you can use is head and you can specify how many rows you want to see. And this will basically just show you the same exact data, but in a, a visual form inside of your notebook. And because the majority of our data is number data, they're floats, we can also use the describe function, which will give us an overview of each of the columns from the average, the standard deviation, the minimum, you know, the 25%, 50%, 75% maximum. It looks like it's taking a little bit longer, um, probably because there's just so much. And so it has to go through each column and give you these kinds of um, high level analyses or, or descriptions of what the columns contain. So this isn't going to be row data. Um, you know, when we did the info, we were getting the number of rows and, and whether or not there were null values on any of the rows for that column. When we did head, we were actually seeing each individual row. Here, we're actually just focusing on the columns. So again, we can see that for each column, we have the same number of rows. However, um, our open, our our average or our mean um, price is going to be 64.99 and our close it's going to be 65.01 so on average it's looking like we go up throughout the day so across these six years um, it looks like on average we will go up um, between open and close it also looks like on average our high tends to be a little bit uh, higher than what our close was and our low a little bit lower so we can imagine there's some fluctuation there um, now this you can't gather a ton of information from this because there's 851,000 entries so while on average that kind of makes sense this doesn't tell us per um, ticker or, or you know company symbol it doesn't tell us um, per year or or per like quarter or anything like that this is just kind of overall the usefulness of this is, um, as I mentioned, if you're a developer and you're trying to use machine learning in some of your solutions, you might want to have a machine learning expert there to make sure that, you know, what you're doing is makes sense and, and, and looks right. But in addition to that, you might also want to have um, a subject matter expert or SME. That's a subject matter expert in the context that you're, you're building this in. 
So in this case, it would have been really nice if I had a financial analyst sitting down with me who could look at this and say, ooh, you know, on average, that looks a little wonky. Maybe we should check the data. Um, so things like the describe function, which gives us this view here, is really useful because it allows us to see if there's anything that looks really odd in kind of like high level in our data. And that's really important because data is not perfect. The way that we collect data, um, who we're collecting it from, how we're collecting it, just all of that isn't always perfect. Either we, you know, forgot to include certain, you know, high priced companies or we were including too many low priced companies. Um, depending on the kind of question that you have, your data should be looking a certain kind of way. I hope that makes sense. It's it's. It's really kind of that combination of making sure that you know what questions you're asking and what you currently have uh, to answer those questions. So in this case, the question that I want to be asking today is can we um, basically find uh, um, uh, patterns inside of our data because I'm just starting to explore whether or not uh, I can understand stock data, basically. So can we find any kind of patterns that might be useful for me when I'm choosing what to buy or sell? Uh, if I were representing a particular company, then I might want to have more information about that company or companies that are in the same bracket or in the same technology group. And so this kind of information might show me like, um, I really think that you know, the company that you're buying and selling at is actually at $1,000. So you don't need to be looking at values that are at 65, right? In this case, it's fine for ours. All right, now this is something that I've just learned about. Um, this is called the Pandas Profiler and, um, or profiling. And basically it gives this visual, um, uh, like view, visual view of your data. So this is somewhat visual. It gives you this kind of table form. Um, but this one actually gives you the ability to see your data and click around and see it in just kind of a, a cleaner way. And again, this is why I really like to use um, pandas as, or er, sorry, um, Python as my, um, uh, as the language for, for my data science exploration. Uh, because there's just so many different libraries that people are building and the combination of having the data scientists and then the folks who are, you know, effective Python developers kind of working together to bring these packages and libraries um, to, to make this experience so much better, I, I think is just really neat. So basically, we want to create a profile report on stocks. OK, that's basically what we're trying to do here. So let's go ahead and do that. Looks like it's trying to render. Awesome. So it brings this up. Um, it's kind of a little hard to see because I have to scroll, but it kind of gives us the same type of information. The number of variables that we have in our data is essentially the number of rows, or sorry, columns, right? So the number of variables is seven. Um, we've got symbol, uh, date, symbol, open, close, low, high, and volume. So seven quote unquote variables. The number of observations, which is what we call each row because each row is in, like observed, right? This is the data that we can observe. Um, and actually, let me switch over to this so that you can see a little bit better without the, the frame. Um, the number of observations that we have is the number of rows. So 851,264. No missing cells, no duplicate rows, um, lots, of, <laughs> lots of memory that it required, um, et cetera. The neat thing is that we can start to see, uh, like this took this long to, to create the analysis. Um, but more interestingly for me, um, uh, I like this interesting thing about warnings, which again, gives you that, that high level data insight into something that might influence the data and your analysis of it. So this is saying that the symbol 
column or variable has high cardinality, it has 501 distinct values, which in our case, that makes sense. We are totally okay with that because um, the symbol is, is the different companies. And so um, we're basically looking at 501 different companies or different tickers or different symbols. You can also take a look at this data a little bit more fine grained in the variables. So the date is going to be again. So it's across from 2010 to it looks like maybe 2017, but I think it just yeah, it ends on on um, December 30th, 2016. Um, and yes, uh, pandas profiling can take quite a few minutes to run depending on your on your machine. So be aware of that. Um, we can see symbol. Uh, these are the different types of symbols that we might have. Um, open and close, we can see a little bit more detailed. So it's kind of the same information that we got from this table, but we can see that there's um, fewer distinct counts. So that's interesting. A lot of times it's very similar. Um, the minimum was, was one and the maximum is 1500. So again, that's when you can start to go into, you know, do I really want to do an analysis of financial data that's so broad? Is that useful for me, for my question that I'm trying to answer? Um, or is that something that um, I want to try to scope down? And um, just to kind of talk a little bit briefly about the data science life cycle, we mentioned this in the um, uh, data science life cycle. We mentioned this in the in the um, video series, but basically one thing that is interesting is um, this is what we call the data science life cycle. And basically you, you first need to have a business understanding and then you need to do data acquisition and understanding, some modeling and deployment. But you can see that this isn't just this like S shape. There's actually arrows that go back and forth between all of them. And the reason for that is because you may have some business understanding, you may have some kind of question that you're trying to answer or something that you're trying to do. But then when you start to look at the data that you have, that may change the type of question that you're trying to answer. Because you might realize that your data doesn't have everything that you need to answer that question or, um, or, uh, or doesn't have enough or something like that or has different data that's more interesting that you didn't realize you would have. Now, in like a perfect world, we would have a question and then we would plan to acquire that data to then be able to answer that question. But for example, if you're trying to analyze stocks over the course of six years, that becomes very difficult because if you didn't know to collect the temperature of weather or like the weather data on that particular day, as well as the stock data, you wouldn't know that there was a potential correlation there, right? I don't think that there is, but... Um, but, you know, uh, you don't necessarily if you need some kind of like historical data or lots of data, um, you don't necessarily know everything that you might want to ask. Um, so it's kind of a give and take. Uh, you do need to, to have this iterative mindset. Um, and in this case, we are um, uh, interested in just kind of all of the data. Um, so we're OK with having uh, tickers that are, you know, at one um, versus 1500. Okay. Another thing that you can do is take a look at these um, profiles based on one individual symbol. Um, so for example, we can take a profile um, that is, or we can create a profile report that is just for the Microsoft ticker or symbol. So I'm only going to look at the symbol column and I only want to um, grab it if the symbol column is equal to MSFT, which is Microsoft. And we're going to go ahead and do profile dot two widgets so we can see it. All right, um, so we can see here that there's still seven variables because there's still seven columns because all of them have the same. 
Um, but we can see that there's only 1,762 observations. So there's only 1,762 rows um, that are associated with Microsoft. Um, we can see that there's some warnings here that the symbol is a constant value of, of Microsoft. Yeah, I mean, we told it to be, so that's understandable. Um, and that date is only unique values, which again, makes sense because we're not going to have two um, stock open and close and average prices for Microsoft on the same day. Over here, we can start to look at the different dates. So again, the dates, I mean, we're just expecting to have it. Um, the symbol, we're just expecting it to be the same. Um, but we can start to look at the open and close. So this is really interesting. We can see that the minimum was 23 and the maximum was 63. Um, so it looks like it likely went up over time. Um, or maybe went down, but we can see that it was stayed in the lower ranges for longer or for more days. Um, same with clothes, we can see that it was 2363, so pretty much um, the same. Uh, our lowest was um, uh, our low numbers for that day, again, still around the same range, and our high numbers still around the same range and the volume of, of stock that was traded. It looks like it actually went up quite a bit. So it was like 8.4 billion um, compared to 319 billion. That's, that's pretty impressive. Okay, so now that we've actually explored our data and we kind of understood it a little bit, uh, it's time to um, kind of better understand or start to like explore this. Uh, yes, this Jupyter server is actually running on my PC. Um, that might be why it's taking a little while. I'm not sure. Um, and yeah, you can use Jupyter inside of VS Code. A and it's one of my favorite things to do. Because um, again, I just like staying in one environment that makes sense for me. So if you haven't already, this data science tutorial on the VS Code docs is really useful for that. Um, uh, I like it because you could also use all of the other VS Code extensions that you might be used to, um, which which is nice. Okay, um, so again, let's start to see if our data looks like starts to make sense. Um, these are just further ways of kind of like understanding it when we're doing this initial exploration. So let's take a look at the number of stocks um, uh, so like the number of symbols that are being reported on a particular day or date. So basically how many unique stocks, um, Ooh, a TensorFlow environment set up in VS Code is a nightmare. Um, I have not tried that yet, uh, but I, I, I will make note of that. I'm actually going to write that down um, as something that I'll try to do. And hopefully I can make a quick video on it and um, get, some, get some help. And uh, we, can, we can make it easier, whether easier um, uh, technically or just at least with some explanation. So TensorFlow setup in VS Code. Perfect. Okay, written down. Um, yeah, so gr group by uh, means that it's going to group all of the dates. So if it was January 1st, 2010, it's going to take January 1st, 2010 and, and count the unique sim or the number of symbols. So count the number of symbols within that date. So that's what it's doing. So what we're going to see is basically something like um, this. Oh, wait, sorry, group by. Is that what you meant that I did a typo and I still, what did I do wrong? Count symbol stock group by head. Symbols, is it symbol? It's symbol. Two typos in the same line. So we can see that on January 4th, 2010, um, there were 467 symbols that had traded on that day, um, whereas on the 5th, there was 468. So maybe a new company, um, yeah, thank you, <laughs> that you were just catching my typo. I appreciate it. Um, uh, that maybe like a company, um, you know, started trading that day. Um, and we can see that generally it was about the same. Uh, we can also look at this 
um, using a bar plot, which I think is just like, I tried this earlier today and it just looked so satisfying. So what we're going to do is we're going to grab the counts index. So that's going to be the date and that's going to be our X axis. And our Y axis is going to be um, the actual count um, of, of the symbol. And let's just go ahead and add some metadata to this to make it easy to, to, to read. So one thing that's really interesting about using like a Jupyter notebook over writing a Python program, for example, um, is that you can really tell a story through this entire notebook. And essentially you could imagine like, like, printing it out as a PDF and sharing it with someone, you know, higher up or something or someone who, who understands it differently or the SME or something like that, where they don't necessarily need to worry about the code. Um, but you could add in information um, that says, like, you know, this is what we're going to be doing next. We're going to be uh, look at how many stocks um, have data for each day. So you could do something like uh, adding in something here and making it something like uh, the following um, uh, graphic demonstrates how many stocks um, have data for each date, something like that. And then you could basically tell this, this long story. Yeah, and Jupyter Notebooks is you can also uh, write in multiple languages. Yep. Awesome. So this one's still trying to to bring that out. Again, remember we have 851,000 rows, so it might take a little while. Um, but after this, uh, what we're going to see with this um, is how many stocks are available on each date. And um, one thing that uh, is important to understand is that if a stock no longer becomes available, meaning the company shut down, uh, we will not get that data, right? So if on, you know, August 29th, 2012, two companies uh, opened up, like added, were added to the stock market and one shut down, we will not know that. We will only see from this data that one was added. So while this does give us, I just love how pretty this is, um, but while this does give us this indication that the number of symbols that are trading on that day is increasing, we don't actually get to see if there are symbols that are going away. Um, this could potentially have survivor bias, meaning we're only focused on the ones that succeed. And that's really, really, really important to make sure that you understand. Because again, with data science, we're only going to get answers as clear as the data that we're collecting and the analysis that we do. There's a lot of room for human error and human bias here. And so it's very, very, very important that you take a minute every time you're, you're going through data to really understand what this data means. Um, the link for the notebook is not available yet, but it will be available um, here after the stream. So it's really important that you take a moment to really understand what it is that you're trying to um, to understand and what it is that your data represents. And that's why I like to explore new data science concepts with a particular context or narrative and not just kind of trying to write things out and get a random data set and see what happens. Because it's not just about being able to type the code sns.barplot blah blah blah. It's about understanding what this is actually representing. So if we were trying to do some kind of analysis of, um, of a, like a success, a success story, then maybe this is useful. But if we also wanted to do an analysis of when 
um, like, can we predict when a company would succeed? It would probably also be important to understand when a company wouldn't. Do you normalize the data or convert to percentage to compare the company stock? Yeah, we will be normalize, normalizing the data later. Definitely. Okay. So um, we don't know for sure that there's survivorship bias here because we don't actually know if there are stocks that have disappeared. Um, but that would be something that we should probably look into. Um, and I would encourage you to look into on your own. Okay, so now we're going to jump into some feature engineering. And this is something that's still fairly like new and interesting to me, but basically it's the ability to um, understand certain features based on the data that we have and how those features might influence the outcomes or, or, or answers that we have. So for example, what we're going to try to build here is going to be a feature target generation. And so we, this is where we're going to do some normalization. We're going to look not only at the actual numbers of the open and close, but also of the log of those numbers and the log of the volume to try to normalize and understand um, the comparison between these different companies. Um, and we're going to try to understand uh, what happens today and how that might affect a future period. Okay, so what might happen in five days or 10 days or 30 days? So we're going to basically create a, um, a like a list of features that's going to contain essentially um, like a, 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 um, a, a, I'm trying to think, an equation that'll evaluate based on that particular um, uh, um, company. Okay. So... Next, we're going to create this function. And we're going to pass in the data frame for it. OK? Um, first, what we want to do is we want to make sure that our dates are in order. And I don't know if you remember, but when we were just glancing through this, 2016 was here at the top. Um, and it looked relatively in order. We can see May, May 11th, May 12th, blah, blah, blah. Um, but then all of a sudden we got to um, December 30th, 2016, and then went down to 2010. And then when we got to December 30th of 2010, we went up to 2011. So, um, uh, it's like using the mouse is, there it goes. Um, oh my gosh. Well, in any case, you can see now it's in January of 2011. Uh, so our, our data is not in uh, date order. And so why it is important to have it in date order is that we're going to use earlier columns or earlier dates to predict later columns or later dates. And so we want to make sure that um, our data is in that correct order. Otherwise, we're going to be using a date in 2016 to predict something that's happening in 2010. And we're going to be training our model based on that. And that's going to be incorrect. So the first thing that we're going to do is um, bring in the data frame. We're cre sorry, create a new data frame um, where it, the index is going to be the same index as the uh, original data frame, so the date. But we're going to make sure that we sort that index. And it didn't matter earlier if we sorted that index or not because we were just looking at it like aggregately where we weren't actually trying to train um, or test any kind of model. And then now we're going to add additional columns to each row that will have each of our additional features. OK, so this first one um, is going to just look at the log of the of the like basically like what happened during the day, the, the, the return during the day. So the difference between the open and the close, right? The log of that. So, oops, we're going to first create the, the column. And it's going to be the first feature. Oops, I did that wrong. Sorry about that. And I'll go ahead and add in some 
comment here. Okay, next what we're going to do is look at the overnight log return. So this is what happened on um, the open of one day compared to the close of a previous day. So the overnight log return. So our second feature is going to be the log of the open of today compared to the close um, of the previous day. Next, let's explore the volume, both just the, the total volume and also the normalize the log volume. So let's look at both. So features three is just going to be the volume and features of four is going to be the log of that. I don't know why I keep putting an N with volume. And then let's also look at the absolute change in the volume. Features one is repeated twice. Thank you. All right, so one day absolute change in volume. I don't need to write that there. <laughs> um, and then we also, it, it would also be good to look at the relative change in volume. And this is where we can use, um, was the index of DF already sorted since you're shifting it? Uh, yes, because we, we sorted here first. Um, and, oh, good question. Oh, good question. Oh, hang on. You might be right. I think we actually want to be using features here. Ooh, good question. Good catch. I think you're right. I think we actually want to be using features here, not DF, because DF is the one that isn't sorted. And that's going to throw things off. I think we want to use features here. I think you were right. Good catch. And oh, so some for some reason, um, VS Code has been like when I copy something, I do a control C and control V and it does it twice. I don't know why this is happening. If anyone else knows why, let me know. Um, but this is why I like pair programming. Okay. So now we're going to do a relative change in volume. And we're going to use this handy dandy um, function here to get that relative change. And next is the is like three really interesting ones. So these are um, like rolling data. So basically we're, we, what we want to look at is over the next five or 10 or 30 days, um, what is the um, average and then normalize that. Okay. So over five, this 
average, and then let's go ahead and normalize that. And we're going to do the exact same thing, but for, see, it did it again, which is fine because I did want to, but why? Why are you doing that? So eight, nine, but we're going to do 10 and 30. And this is the um, rolling averages of different periods. And um, we also just want original data also. Right, so um, let's get our lows, highs, and close. And then now we're going to start to look at the um, uh, high and low, like what happened during the day. Okay, so the double pasting inside of Jupyter environment is going to be fixed in VS Code 1.48 to be released soon. Thank you. <laughs> I just noticed it like a couple of days ago, and so I haven't even had a chance to file a... Um, a bug report, but I'm glad to know that others have, and it's not just me. Um, I don't know about you, but every time something goes wrong, I immediately think, oh, this must be a Sarah problem and not a problem that everyone else has, which is a habit that I need to get out of because oftentimes it is just a problem that everyone is having, and I could have filed a bug report sooner. <laughs> I'm not crazy. Yay! Confirmation. Um, so now what we can do is we can also look at the log returns, the normalized returns over different time periods. Oh, thanks. Y'all are awesome too. <laughs> control shift B. Oh, okay. Thank you. I will use control shift B in the meantime. <laughs> we will try it right now because we're going to look at the log returns over different time periods and I'm going to need to control. Control C, control V. So let's do this. Uh, NP, so we're going to take the log um, of DF close over, oops, not DF, we want features, um, over features close but shifted by one day. And let's go ahead and copy and paste. Yeah, copy, nope, copy. Control shift V. Oh, thank you, thank you. Which I needed to there anyways, but let's and we're gonna shift by five days and we're gonna shift by ten days. And then we're gonna return that entire um, features return. Uh, typo in F13. Yes, thank you. That should be a minus and not an equals. I appreciate it. All right. So I think this will get all of our features that we want. So let's go ahead and run this just so that we have access to that function. It shouldn't have any output because we haven't actually called it. Oh, did I do 12? Oh, gosh. Thank you. This is why they like recommend that we have the code and we just copy and paste, but I like writing it out. <laughs> I don't know. I'm also the kind of person that when I delete something, I will rewrite it instead of just, or if I mess have a typo earlier in a sentence, I'll just delete and rewrite. I don't know, maybe not a good idea. Um, 
Okay, so now let's use what we just did and let's try to figure out if we can predict the value of a stock price 10 days into the future using what's called a prediction horizon. And again, we did this similarly. Um, awesome. I'm glad that you think it works well for teaching. I think it slows it down and it allows you to like think with me. So that's also why I do it. Um, so let's, we, we did this in the video series as well with a, a like the horizon, the prediction horizon basically of like, hey, I want to look this many days in the future. With the bike sharing app, we did 14 days in the future. Um, in this case, we're going to do 10 days. It's somewhat arbitrary. Um, again, in this case, this is when you would probably want to have some kind of subject matter expert in the room to tell you what is an effective number of days to predict in the future. That might depend on the type of stock that you're doing. That might depend on some um, um, like data that might be coming in. That might depend on the type of or like the month or the type of year that's happening. So as an example, um, re my husband is a bioinformatics scientist and uh, he is interested in biological like bioscience companies and their stocks. And something that's interesting about biological companies is that they're going to have studies that are done. So if, if there's a study that they're doing or conducting that's going to be coming out um, soon, you might not want to try to predict for a date after that study because that study, those study results are likely to um, yield a lot of information and likely to change the um, rise or fall of that stock. And so you'd probably only want to predict while there is no new data because that's going to be what we understand to be true about that stock that day. Um, similarly, if you are waiting for announcements from a large tech company from one of their, you know, large like um, uh, events, you might want to not predict from the date before the event to the date after the event because something might have been announced that might change their stock. Um, again, I am not a financial advisor, uh, so I'm not positive about this, but that's why in this case, we're going to use a predicted horizon uh, or a prediction horizon of 10 days. But really, that's just an arbitrary number that we're choosing today. OK, so let's get our ticker list. So this is just the list of all of the unique symbols in our stocks. And um, let's do our prediction horizon. And pre like the, the prediction horizons, it's kind of like opposite. So we're going to do negative 10 because what we want to do, and actually let's do five days just to make this, this simpler. We're going to do negative five because um, uh, we're going to use that as to go backwards to see what was happening five days before to help train our data. So um, these are where you can definitely just play around with this data and experiment with it on your own. And I encourage you to. Um, let's go ahead and just choose the ticker Microsoft. Why not? Let's... And then let's make sure that we're going to um, s like have five different splits. Okay, so this is where we're going to split um, uh, the data to, 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 to know what, what's happening on each of the days. And what we're going to do is we're going to save our features into a data frame called features, which is going to call our um, feature target generation. And in this case, because if you were wondering, like me, feature target generation, um, what we wrote up here requires that you're only looking at one ticker because notice that we're like looking at the next like features open compared to features closed dot shift one um if this could be the same date and a different ticker which wouldn't make any sense to compare right so we do need to make sure that we're only looking at one ticker because as we know one ticker um will have um uh only unique dates in the function you just wrote isn't the features data frame empty aside from the index um, so we grabbed the index here and, oh, that's why it's data frame. Yes, you were right. Um, wait, no, 2D data frame, we're cop, 
Yes, you were right. That's why we need data frame. I'll go back up and fix that. Yes, thank you. Um, yeah, no, you're right. Okay, give me one second. Let me finish this line and then I'll go back and fix that. And that's why we had data frame there and not, um, uh, not uh, what's it called? Yeah, my brain, uh, not uh, features. Yes, you're right. Okay, so we're gonna grab stocks and we're gonna specifically look at the symbol for the ticker that we specified. Okay, that's why <laughs> we did wanna have DF here because um, we're using the index, which is uh, um, the date, uh, but then we're only gonna be looking at this particular uh, ticker to grab this information from the original data frame so that our features um, data frame only has our features columns and doesn't also have all of the other columns. Thank you, you are correct. I was like, I'm pretty sure it should be DF, but now I can't think of a reason why it should be. Um, and I forgot that we were only grabbing the indices there. So I don't think we need to sort the DF because I think that the index is going to grab the correct one. It doesn't, it's not looking for that same number. Um, it's looking for, well, ooh. Good question. Now I can't remember. So if we don't sort the DF and we're looking for um, DF close, that's going to grab that same. So if we're copying all of the indices over into features, we're assigning the same feature. So if DF, oh, sorry. So, so okay. So DF is the, is the stocks from Microsoft. Um, we don't, so this is, so DF is only going to have unique dates. And since we're matching the features indices to the DF's index, we don't need to sort DF because it's going to match it on the, on the index, not on the row number. So it doesn't really matter if DF is sorted because we're going to grab that date, that index. Okay, so let's rerun this before I forget. Make sure that's completed. Okay, and then now um, we're going to, to run this. Oh, wonderful. What did I do wrong? Oops. Or am I wrong? Data frame has no column attribute. Wait, what? Data frame has no column attribute. Did I? Oh, is it up here actually? Data frame, data frame. You have a column. No, you don't. It's not column. Sorry, this is volume specifically looking at the volume, not column. Okay, oh, I forgot to do shift. Okay, okay, now we can rerun this. Okay, <sighs> we do call sort index when we create features um, and that is uh, mainly just so that we have all of our dates sorted. I'm trying to think now, I think we act, it actually doesn't really matter um, because we are just going to use the index, but uh, it, we just, it, it'd be good to have it in order. Just joined in. What are we building here? We are looking at stock data and um, trying to predict when we should buy and sell. <laughs> okay, so... Uh, Basically, what we have now are the features that we care about. So we're not going to be looking at the raw data. We're not going to be looking at this data here. Um, we're not going to be looking at this data to perform an analysis on, right? We're not even going to be looking at this subset of data. Um, I think that I'm pretty sure that 
the the fact that the indices are misaligned mm. you know what i think that it doesn't hurt to sort it so let's just do that i'm 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 not trying to not sort it because i'm trying to be difficult i'm more trying to not sort it because i want to know if i have to sort it or not and now i can't remember um so if someone else knows better feel free to add in the comments um but yeah let's go ahead and um what we can do is let's send this in. With it sorted. So let's rerun that. OK, so now we are going to sort what's coming in as well, which then means we probably don't need to sort this one, but that's OK. Now they're both sorted for sure. <laughs> In fact, let's just go ahead and get rid of this one. Let's just say that we're going to have them be the same. Then that way there's no chance that there's an accidental change. OK, cool. Um, so we're not going to be looking at the data. Like we're not going to be looking at the actual open and close and, um, and low and high and volume. We're going to be looking at the features that we created that normalized our data, that compared our data, that got more interesting information from our data. And that's basically what featureization is. It's choosing the, um, the truth behind your data uh, that you want to perform the analysis on. OK, and I want to say truth with a slight caveat, because, again, remember, truth is only as true as the data that you've collected um, and how you collected it and not necessarily universally true. So, for example, if for some reason we didn't collect data on Microsoft for the month of May every single year, then our data would not be true um, because we're missing that kind of data. OK. Uh, we did a whole video on like ethics and AI in our video series as well, which, by the way, um, I just realized, like I keep mentioning this video series. Um, if you want to take a look at it, um, we have this. Uh, oops, that's the wrong one um, right here. Um, oh, gosh, I have to update my account recovery settings. Oh, my gosh, I don't want to do this right this second. Can we not do this right now? Confirm. OK, there we go. Um, we do have this uh, GitHub repo with the links to the code and also the links to um, the series that you can check out. In particular, um, uh, again, we use Visual Studio Code, but we also jump into Azure Machine Learning in that one. OK, so next what we're going to do is um, we're going to start actually preparing and splitting our data to perform this analysis. So the first thing that we're going to do is try to predict um, the number of days in the future that we specified up here. So this is going to be five days in the future. Um, so we're going to take a future value and move it, then that number into the past. And that's why it was negative, right? So we're going to take the future, um, the, the future value and shift it negative. And that's going to be the one that we want to um, uh, try to use to do the prediction, right? So um, the close is what is interesting to us because that's going to be the value of our stock at close, which is when we want to like sell, right? Or what, what we want to know because we maybe you would set it up to sell on close. And remember from way earlier before um, that the – uh, low and high from this one, we can see that our low and our high go above, um, on average, our open and our close, above and below our open and our close, right? So we wouldn't want to have the high value or the low value. We'd want to have the close value because there's some fluctuation in between. Okay, so first we're going to specify our Y, which is the F12 column shifted by our prediction horizon. Um, there will be rows that don't have values because there is no feature data. So when we get to the last rows, we're not going to have that future data, okay? So we need to be able to um, know 
the values that don't have any um, uh, valid target values. And those are basically going to be all of the values inside of y that are not a number. Um, and then we also want to, so then we want to remove the rows that do not have valid target values from, um, uh, from our input and output. So like our, our, our um, when we're doing training, right, we're going to have X and Y, X being the one that we use to predict Y. So from both our X is going to be all of our features, um, but not the ones that are not a number. So all of the, sorry, all of our features, um, making sure that we don't have ones that don't, making sure that we only have ones that don't have not a number. <sighs> so we're only including the ones that have valid target values. And again, we're removing the ones that are shifted, which is the ones that are um, removing the ones that are not a number. Couple different ways. And then now we're going to do a time series split. Okay. And basically, um, this is just a, a function that you can use. Again, this is where um, it would be great to go back and understand the actual math behind all of this. Um, in this case, for my uh, expertise at this time, I'm going to focus on, um, on the uh, functions that we have available. Um, remember, you can always get this information and kind of get an understanding of, of what these, oops, what these do. Um, so scikit-learn, oops, let me make sure I'm showing the browser. Scikit-learn time series split. So it provides train and test indices to split time series data so this is time series data because it is unique dates um, and our data is basically a bunch of rows of unique dates that are observed at fixed time intervals into train and testing sets. Um, so basically what we're doing is we're grabbing, we're creating sets of data to say like this is one set of data and then that can be, um, that comes before this other set of data to then allow, um, to make sure that what we are predicting is uh, not something in the past. I hope that made sense. Um, this is where you can like continue to learn more about what's behind it all, uh, what k-folds cross validators do, um, and, and kind of like dive into that rabbit hole. Um, but on the scikit-learn site, so this is the scikit-learn site, um, and I'll add all of these links to the GitHub repo as well, by the way. Um, but the scikit-learn site uh, will have example uh, um, code that you can that you can run. Okay. So next, what we're going to do is um, just print out that time series split. So we have um, five splits. Now we can start to look at our feature data and compare that to what we saw before. So if we remember our features.info, um, if, we, if we remember our um, stock info, we had um, 851,000. We only have 1,700 here. Um, remember when we looked at it with the pandas profiling, that was correct. We can see that we have values for all of them, that they're all floats, and we have no null values. So that's good. OK, so now we're going to actually start going into building our first model. Um, this is a regression problem because what we're doing is predicting a price, which is a continuous value. And so that's why this is a regression problem, in, in, in particular, linear regression problem. So. Um, we're going to use a pretty standard linear regression here. 
And basically what we're going to be doing is building out this model. Um, but we're also going to be using um, scikit-learn's linear regression. Okay, so the model that we're going to use as input to our function to do the um, analysis is going to be scikit-learn's linear regression model, which you can find on here. Um, So you can read more about it here, um, all about the different uh, parameters and, and uh, examples of how to run this code and, and all of that. Okay. Oops. So we're going to create um, a function and it's going to be our time series reporting function. Okay, so it's going to call our model. It's a time series, and we're going to it's going to basically do the report. So we're going to run the model. We're going to get the 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 um, the time series data, right? So this is like our our split. Um, we're going to get our x and our y that we created before. And I'm actually I can't remember what um, impute means. Let me grab that. It's something that I've always just added in there. Um, and I can't remember, let me pull up the, we're going to use it um, uh, um, oh, sorry, I remember now. So uh, what's interesting about our data is that we do actually have some missing values. So even though we have non-null values um, up at the top, uh, we will have some like missing values essentially. Uh, uh, because there might be days on a calendar that there were no trades, okay, or that like it wasn't open. And so because this is a time series forecast, there will actually be some null values, not in the feature set, but in like the time, right, in dates. Um, and so we'll, we'll want to make sure um, that we, uh, if there were no, sorry, okay, my brain. In this case, we don't have any null values because we specifically only are grabbing the dates that did have trades. If we were to have um, data that had all dates, including the dates where there were no trades, so rather than creating our um, features index from our data frame index that only has the dates that were there were trades, if we instead created our features data frame um, to it have the index be all of the days, all of the dates between January 1st, 2010 and, um, and December 30th or 31st, uh, 2012 or 16, um, then we would have dates where there were, where there was no data, um, because it might've been a weekend or something or, or a holiday. Okay. Because time series forecast doesn't, can't handle dates with, um, or sorry, because, Linear regression can't handle not a number uh, missing data because it, it is extremely dependent on there being data on every single day. Then if there was missing data, we would have impute be true and we would specifically fill in that data um, with, with um, zeros, okay, for like a just in case. There might be better choices than just zero. You might want to fill it in with forward fill or something like that. And then later um, ones, we do actually do that. But in this case, we're just going to fill it in um, with zero. Okay. So um, the first thing that we're going to do is we're going to um, look at our uh, our TC, TSCV data. Um, so that was what we created up here, our time series split. Okay. And um, for every X, um, we're going to grab the minimum number um, and the maximum number. So we're basically training um, with our X on our uh, training data that we split from the time series split um, uh, time series split. I thought there was another word. So our time series split created our X and our Y, and we want to grab um, all of our X and Y 
data, all of it, and we want to say this we're training from this date to this date. Remember, we're doing it on our index, on our date. So we're training from this date to this date, and then we're going to test from this date to this date. Okay, and we're going to do that for each of our um, different splits for our X data and our Y data. Okay, so basically for um, our training indices and our testing indices in our time series split data um, for each of the splits on X, we want to grab the training data or we want to we want you to know that we're training our data from this date in x to this date in x So from our training data, we're only going to grab the, um, so for each of our splits, we're only going to get the earliest date, or we're saying that we're going to test from the earliest date to the latest date in that split. Okay? So remember, we're splitting five times, and so we're going to train from a certain date to another date and just see how well we're able to predict in those dates. And then we're going to test from a certain date to another date. And then we're going to train, et cetera, et cetera. This will become clear when we actually run through it. We're going to do the same thing. Um, and this, and this is a little too much. We're going to do the same thing, uh, but for our testing data. So our test is going to be from our um, same like date, okay? Except we're, um, sorry, not same date. Uh, from the X data, we're going to test from these indices. Then we're actually going to split um, our data into X train and X test, which is basically going to be um, our train indice and our test indice. So what we're doing here is um, we're saying that our training data is going to be all of our X values um, within this training indice, so this date, and our testing data is going to be all of our X values within this one because that's how we split it. And we're going to do the same thing for Y. And yeah, we do have X capital and Y lowercase, and that's just a common convention. I don't, actually, I have not researched why that's a common convention, but that's typically what we do. Remember, we're going to say if our impute is true, um, then what we want to do is make sure that our X train data gets filled in. And this is where I would encourage you to fill this in with something else. Um, try it out and see if zero is not the right thing to fill it in with. And then for each of our um, splits, we're going to fit our model. So this is going to be the linear regression model from scikit-learn. We're going to fit our model on the X train data and the Y train data. Then we're going to predict, oops, and measure on our training data.
And remember at the beginning we said that we were going to use the, the mean squared error. So that's what we're going to do. So our root mean, squeed, root mean squared error is um, going to be our mean squared error, passing in the y train and the y prediction train. And we aren't going to have it be um, squared. And then we're basically going to do the same thing, but on the testing data. And then let's just print a um, like an extra enter. <laughs> oh, x is a matrix and y is a vector. So matrices tend to be capitalized letters and vectors tend to be lowercase letters. And so it carried over to data science like that. And that's why it's useful to understand the math behind it all. <laughs> Thank you. I appreciate the explanation. So basically for each of our splits that we said that we were going to, that we are using the time series split up here, um, remember we said it was going to be five. So for each of our splits, we're going to um, go through and we're going to uh, um, get our training dates and our testing dates. So the, the dates that we want to train and the dates that we want to test. Um, and we're going to uh, basically fit our training data um, predict using the training data and then predict using the testing data. So this is going to be like our true test of whether or not we're doing it well. So when we actually run this, let's make sure there are no errors here. Oh, there is. Uh, am I missing something? Oh, I'm missing a, a colon print I. Okay. Perfect. So let's actually try this out because once we start to see it, I think it makes a little bit more sense. So um, let's make sure that we have our linear regression model. So we're going to grab our linear regression model. Oops. And we're basically going to call our report function, passing in the linear regression model, the um, time series split that we created, our x, which is our um, uh, predictor, and our y, which is our predicted. And we're actually going to say impute equals true in case there are anything, anything that we missed, but there shouldn't be. So when we run this, we should get five of these kind of like printouts of these. Oh, good. What did I do wrong? Oops. Okay, so we can see um, that we are going to train from January 4th, 2010, which is the first date that Microsoft traded in this data set, to uh, March 8th, 2011. And we want to test from March 9th, 2011 to April, uh, May 3rd, 2012. And so again, remember that we don't want our training data and our testing data to overlap because then we can... Um, uh, potentially um, uh, like inform too much or overfit, right? We could say like, well, obviously it's that. We already know it's that. So yeah, it's not useful information. Um, you're currently doing a CS bachelor's and want to focus on data science. Any paths or courses to recommend? Um, that's a really great question. Um, uh, right at the end, I think we've still got about 25 minutes. So right at the end, I will share some, some resources with you. Um, so then we can see that we uh, tested our data on our training results and our testing results. And we can see that our root mean squared error will, or yeah, is um, 0.76 on our training results and 0.88 on our testing results. And we can see that as we go through it um, over and over and over again, right? So this time we're going to grab from from uh, January 4th, 2010 to May 3rd, 2012. And then we're going to go from May 4th, 2012 to 
um, July 3rd, 2013. So we're getting a slightly larger um, uh, grab of our data for our training. Um, and then furthermore, uh, testing the same amount, we can see that our training results get better, right? So on our training data, it goes up to 0.80 and our testing data goes up to 0.95. Um, and so we can continue to do this and we can see it like um, um, going farther and farther up. So we can see that in each period we do better in training than we do in testing, um, which is typical uh, because um, uh, we, our training data, we know the answers, right? Um, how do we partition, partition time series data to have a validation set? I actually don't know how to do that. Um, I mean, so we've got the validation set in that we have all of the data here. Um, so we are able to validate that the linear regression model is going to value um, validate uh, using our training data, right? So we've got X and Y, which is the correct data. So yeah, sorry. And I realized I said that opposite. Um, we don't want it to be big. We can see it getting worse because the number is getting bigger and our training data is better than our testing data because our training data is lower. Thank you. Um, and so, uh, what's interesting is, um, I'm sorry, I just lost my train of thought. Hi everyone. Okay. Um, since we are running low on time, I did want to show one more model that you can run on this. Um, so then that way you could hopefully start to like explore things on your own. Um, and I do highly recommend checking out what, what linear or what root mean squared error is. Um, and we do go over that a bit in the video series. Um, uh, there's a root mean squared error. Uh, in particular, I did like a whole, a whole video on it as I was trying to learn and understand it as well. Um, so down on here, um, this video, I believe, yes. So this video right here um, talks specifically about um, forecast horizons and um, the root mean squared error, squared error and the mean absolute error. So you can check that video out for a better explanation on that. Uh, but I did wanna show one more thing before we go and then I will share with you uh, um, a couple of resources to your question earlier. So random forest is another type of model that basically blends a group of decision trees so like a decision tree is kind of what you what what it sounds like to the effect of like uh, you have um, uh, 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 one decision or, or you would have to make a decision and based on which decision you make, you create kind of like two or three or four, however many options. And then based on a decision you would make further from there, you would go. So basically um, it's a decision tree, each of which, so it's a group of decision trees, each of which have access to a subsample of the features. So remember we made like 16 features. So each decision tree wouldn't have all of the features. Okay, it's commonly used because it tends to work well with relatively little tuning of hyperparameters. Um, and so it's less likely to overfit. Uh, it's not typically used in, it, oh gosh, this word, um, uh, econometrics. <laughs> so basically the data analysis of economic data um, or the analysis of economic data, right? It's not commonly used mainly because it's not typically a linear structure, which um, like economics tends to have some linearity to it because it's based on dates and, and time progressing. Um, but uh, it is often used in other types of predictions. And so I thought that we would explore it a little bit so you can see it um, and see how different it is. Uh, we might be able to bring in, we might be able to lower our training data error in this case um, 
but it'll likely lead to some some overfitting. So I just wanted to show it to you. So basically, um, what's neat is that when you want to keep trying out new models, now all you have to do is say, hey, I want to use this model. And I'm going to call my reporting function. And I'm going to be passing in that model instead of the linear regression model. OK. And then we can try that. And so um, here, what we actually see is um, we get better results. So see how it's lower on our training results? It's much better than we did up here. This was 0.76 and we got 0.23 here. So we're, we're not far off from the correct answer. Um, however, uh, our test results are not as good. So we can see up here we were at 0.88 and then now we're at 1.17, which likely means that we are overfitting. OK, so if we're overfitting, what it means is that our training data is going to look great. It's like, yes, when you look at your training data, you fit you fit your model based on the input and output that you gave me. Awesome. I know for a fact or, you know, with only point with only 23 percent error, I know that this is true. But then your testing data is so far off. It's so wrong, which means that you're not good at predicting things that you don't already know. That's basically what overfitting means. OK, so we can see that this is not a great model to use on our data because when um, we are training our data, we're going to be like, yes, awesome. We've got really great results. We've got low error. We're, we're, we're doing great. And then we're just going to send out that model into the wild. And then all of a sudden we're going to start investing in these stocks and then we're going to lose a bunch of money and we're going to be like, why did we do that? And it's going to be because you were, had a, a model that was overfitted. Um, so this is where you get to try like a bunch of other models if you want. Um, another one is the extra trees regressor model, um, which might do better than our random forest regressor, uh, but will probably again lead to some overfitting. Um, there's also a different package, which I have not had a chance to explore this one yet. So um, uh, we're not going to do it here, um, but the XG Boost um, is a library uh, that that has machine learning algorithms under the gradient boosting framework. So let me just send this link over to you. Um, and basically, um, uh, it, it offers just a bunch of additional models, and I encourage you to, to go check those out. You can use an XGB regressor model, um, which is um, uh, perhaps likely to get you better results. All right. So we've got all of our code written here. I'm going to go ahead and save this file. Um, and I'm actually going to go ahead and add it over into the GitHub repo now. So then that way you have access to it immediately following this. Um, but I did want to um, uh, also take a second to answer your question around um, what what might you want to do. Um, so let me bring this over. Oops, let me just grab this. Um, if you're studying computer science and you're interested in learning more, um, what you might want to do, um, let's say, let's say not save, and let me just push uh, um, finance, commit to main, and push. Um, so let me go ahead and change over to my browser and let me share a couple of things with you. Um, so first of all, again, uh, on our GitHub Reactors repository, which is this one right here, um, you can find a bunch of different content. Let me zoom in a little bit for you. Uh, you can find a bunch of different content. In particular, um, we do have these like full workshops that we've developed that we um, uh, sometimes we used to run in person, sometimes we'll run longer events uh, where we'll go through the majority of this data. And so you can find a lot of this stuff on here. Um, 
Uh, for example, in our Data Science 1, we've got not only a bunch of workshop materials walking you through the introduction to Python, um, but we also have some projects, for example, a cryptocurrency project that uses some of the same topics that are over there. Um, so we, uh, uh, yeah, I know, I'm sorry. It's not a laptop. It's actually a really powerful machine. I just live far away and have pretty bad internet. I, I apologize for that. Um, uh, so we've got some projects here, for example, this cryptocurrency project, which I'll put the link to in here. Um, in addition to this, we also have our um, online resources. So for example, if you're interested in learning more, oops, uh, more about data science, um, you can s go back to some of our old events. So we did a bunch of events over here. Um, there's, there's YouTube recordings, and these are all on our um, uh, Microsoft Reactor YouTube channel. So a lot of our content is also here, and um, uh, we, I, I highly recommend that you check those out. In addition to that, we do have uh, Microsoft Learn, which is a learning platform. And one thing that I really like about Learn is you can click on Browse All Paths, and you can choose Data Scientist, for example. And there's a bunch of learning resources here that are all 100% free, um, including if it requires some kind of Azure, we'll actually open up an Azure portal for you right in the lesson, and, and, and you can run through it in there. Um, sometimes it will, like Azure Machine Learning Designer requires actually using the Azure Machine Learning Designer, um, but there are free trials for you, so um, I recommend checking those out. So um, yeah, this is another great resource for you. Um, all of them are free or you can do a free trial. And then there's also, um, if you are a student, there is a specific learn page for students, um, which uh, again, kind of focuses on content that you as a student might be interested in. And I, I say student because this is just stuff that we've done in, done in collaboration with universities and, and university students, like the ones who are um, Microsoft Learn Student Ambassadors. But uh, if you are an adult and don't identify as a student, these are still useful and they're still interesting um, because we go into things like using AI to track wild polar bears um, or helping remote farmers protect their crops with text message weather alert using Azure Functions. So it still introduces you to that same technology or those same concepts like Azure Functions or Custom Vision um, or AI, uh, but allows you to do it in a way that has that additional context like we were talking about earlier. So I recommend checking those out as well. Um, in this same one, you can also just choose student as the role over here. Um, and you can do that in addition to data scientist, for example, and you can find all the ones that we think are great if you are a beginner and interested in data science. So those are just some of the resources for you. Um, in addition to that, we do have live streams that are coming up and that we do four times a week, basically. So um, the live streams that are coming up in the next couple of weeks, um, Next week, we have uh, four more live streams on machine learning and data science to continue with our um, journey through the data science world. Um, so we, uh, Francesca is going to be interviewing some uh, Azure Machine Learning developers. So they're the folks who develop Azure Machine Learning on Monday. Um, she's going to walk you through doing a bunch of different types of things using Azure Machine Learning. Um, again, there are free trials. Um, so you can just look up uh, Azure free trial and there's this one if you are um, quote unquote just an adult. Um, and then if you are uh, a student, there is actually a free trial if you can verify your um, student um, uh, status. The go-to language for machine learning methods, um, what I have seen growing tremendously is Python. Um, and I say that both from the perspective of the tools that I've seen that have become useful, um, things like uh, the libraries like Scikit-Learn and the libraries like NumPy and Pandas. Um, in addition to that, though, uh, like I mentioned, my husband is actually a bioinformatics scientist. So he deals with large amounts of um, bioinformatics data and he his go-to language is Python and that seems to be the industry standard over there as well. Um, you'll still find quite a few people who are doing data analysis in R, um, but Python seems to be the one that is 
rising above um, mainly because of the access to so many different packages and libraries um, and the growth of those. Uh, and finally, um, uh, this is a part of our uh, developer introduction to data science kind of um, series that we did. Francesca and I did this series. It's about an hour and a half in total with 28 different videos um, for you to explore. So um, we do have resources for each of them um, that are not only a GitHub repository that I mentioned earlier with all of the code that we walk through, um, but also some learning resources on Microsoft Learn that we think might be a good place for you to get started. So if this kind of thing was interesting for you, I recommend that you go check these out. Um, and remember that next week, I will be going through eight different machine learning examples um, for uh, trying out just basically like the different, the different types of machine learning um, algorithms. So aka.ms slash algorithm um, cheat sheet is uh, what is going to be guiding me. And this cheat sheet basically walks you through um, uh, how to choose which machine learning algorithm you might want to be using. Uh, so you ask, answer the question, what do you want to do? And um, for example, in this case, we were trying to predict values, which is how we knew that we wanted a regression type model. But if we were trying to classify images, we might want to use um, an image classification. Or if we were trying to predict between two categories, we might want to use a two class classification. Um, so this is the, these are the eight different ones that I'm going to try to come up with some example that makes sense in my brain and share it with you all. Um, so thank you so much everyone for joining us. Uh, we uh, are excited to have you um, with us each week. And again, if you missed any for any reason, either the ones from this week, uh, which will be up by tomorrow evening Pacific time or the ones um, that we've done in the past, you can check it out on our YouTube channel. And thank you so much um, for uh, uh, answering more technical questions in the comments. I really appreciate it. And that's really what this is for, is to, to create a community. So uh, we appreciate your participation, not only in watching and listening, um, but also participating in the chat. Um, and we hope to see you again soon. Thanks, everyone. <laughs>